thousands of people <laughs> for the events we're going to have, you know, adds up. So anyway, really happy with everybody that came here. It's a terrific thing. We're also videoing it, and it'll be, uh, if I can figure out how to upload it on YouTube, or if there's some experts in that, like you know, uh, it's probably going to be about a 15 gig file. So other people do it, so I guess we'll figure out how to do that too. And uh, so I'm Marty Waldman, and uh, our local American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics representative here in Las Vegas. And uh, just like to introduce real quick a couple of our brand new board members. There's George Wagner sitting over there. Kathy Bax. And um, so we're, we're painting new territory here in Las Vegas. And uh, a lot of exciting things coming. So, and let's see, this guy over here, if you'd like to come up. Um, we actually have a, another person too, but he's on the phone. So you have your own mic. Uh, this is Denny Almer. He's the guy who I, when I, I put out the, the last thing saying we have a special guest. Uh, he was my uh, boss in flight crew systems, work with astronauts and their equipment. And he has some interesting stories that he'll be uh, coming in with about that. But he has a long career in the Air Force and uh, worked Minuteman and uh, down in the launch silos and um, a lot of interesting things after that. Then worked for a couple of contracts, but he'll tell you all that stuff. He remembers it more than I do. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Well, uh, Marty mentioned that I started uh, the Air Force in uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota, which is where I live right now with my wife and kid. One kid, the other kid's out in Long Beach. We haven't convinced her to come to the Arctic, <laughs> even though they were both born in Grand Forks. But uh, um, as, Marty, as Marty was saying, uh, I was uh, 23 years in the Air Force and a lot of uh, uh, missile launch, ICBM, uh, space shuttle, of course, that's why I'm here, uh, and a lot of uh, Earth satellite command and control type positions in both the development uh, of requirements and uh, all the way through the operation of those. So it was a, a pretty varied career. I was uh, uh, honored and got up every day and had a smile on my face when I went to work. Marty keeps telling me I had the easiest job he can ever remember. <laughs> Anybody best in the job, Air Force? Not as easy as <laughs> Well, at the best, okay. <laughs> but then after uh, I left the Air, For uh, the Air Force on active duty, I retired in 97. I joined the contractor workforce and for 17 years uh, also continued to support the Air Force in space launch operations at Vandenberg Air Force Base. So I am intimately familiar with Vandenberg. Uh, and then in addition to that, I decided seven years ago to uh, change from uh, space flight to aeronautics. And I got into the UAV business since it was, seemed to be a coming trend. And so I worked all three systems, the Predators, the Reapers, and also uh, that was out of San Diego. And then Global Hawk was my last system at the Grand Forks Air Force Base. So I retired a year ago this month. And- uh, How's about your deployments? I haven't stopped. Oh, the deployments, yeah. I spent four months in Afghanistan. Uh, I was scheduled to go to Africa. I, I snuck out of that one. And for some strange reason, instead of giving me a gold watch at retirement, they sent me to Sicily for three months. <laughs> so I, I took that instead. So. But uh, that pretty much sums up my uh, experience. But like I say, tonight we're talking shuttle. Um, I was down here visiting Marty uh, on a long trip. Well, uh, a trip that I had planned many years uh, ago, and I promised Marty that I, as soon as I retired, I'd come down and visit him. Well, it happened right after the first of the year. And he said, well, you should have waited about three weeks. We're gonna have this thing on shuttle. So I decided to come back and join him uh, on the stage. So um, in addition to that, I have two microphones, not that I need both of them, but if there are any questions uh, from you all, I would be glad to go around, circulate the microphone and make sure that you get your questions answered. If you don't uh, use the microphone, we heard that you won't, your voice won't get recorded on the video. So it's kind of essential. So just raise your hand and I'll come around if you have a question. That's at the end, once you have questions. No, really? Yeah. Marty also told me it was going to be like Johnny Carson 
I guess I'm <laughs> And we have one other, okay, um, on the phone is, uh, are you there, Bernie? Okay, good. Um, this is Bernie Benninger in this little box right here. But he's back, he had a long career uh, down in Point Magoo and then moved up to Vandenberg. He worked, he worked for the range for the mold program. Um, and he retired in like 80, 86 or 87? 87. 87, okay. And uh, I visit and I go back there still with my work about for a week each month and I usually get to visit with Bernie and we talk about things that happened a long time ago like they were yesterday. You all know how that is. And uh, I'd just like to have Bernie say hello. And some of the charts in here, he, uh, like this chart, he actually had an org chart from the Manned Orbiting Lab Program, which is on the table. And we also have it up here as a slide. But you can't read it on the slide. But if you want to look at it on the table afterwards, it's kind of fun to look at. So Bernie, say hello to, there's about 3,850 people in the <laughs> 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 Say hello to them. Okay. We're greeting from the California Central Coast. We just had another very warm winter day. I hope you're all going to enjoy Marty's presentation tonight. A lot of interesting history there. By the way, you might be aware that a Delta IV mission was launched yesterday from Slick 6 from Vandenberg at 3.45 in the morning, and I slept through it. <laughs> Usually I can watch these from my bedroom window, but in this high-tech age, I went to Google and YouTube today and got to see the whole thing. The video of the launch pad, the countdown, liftoff, ascent. Don't you love all we can do these days? Anyway, have a good evening. Enjoy the rest of the briefing. Thank you, Marty. And he'll be listening in, so either of these two guys could correct me on some item. And uh, Bernie, I, I didn't get to mention, Bernie was the first Air Force civilian working shuttle at Vandenberg and did we come up to the slide he did like a hundred how many 192 briefings yeah 192 briefings and this is the final one so he's listening in with us so anyway let's get into the briefing now we have to be packed up and out of here by 8 30 so we'll probably go go to like 805 810 and then you know, come up and look at stuff while we kind of put away the food and all that. So, and again, if you like to come to our after event get together, you're welcome to. So, um, main thing, people have been asking me a lot about the Challenger, what happened, I go into that, but that's not really the point of this briefing. This is about what the Challenger event in 1986 did to the operations at Vandenberg. I really want you all to feel like you were there. Uh, so, let's see. Oh, I go to that. Okay. So this is kind of like the fly, the original flyer. Can y'all hear me? Okay. No, I hold the microphone. Sorry. Don't look like it hurts me here. You're good, Marty. Okay. Hold it on the top. And um, so this is more about why the shuttle program. Well, some, uh, I guess most of you know that we were intending to launch a space shuttle from Vandenberg, but, um, and there was, it was a whole lot different setup than in Florida. Uh, the geography of the area, the mountains, this, that, whatever, is totally different operation. And just, uh, I think it's about three, I don't know, Bernie, about $3 billion of infrastructure. Yeah, he says, I think so. So a lot of effort, a lot of time, yeah, and we'll get into all that. Okay, our, let's see, there's a laser pointer on here somewhere. Nope, oh, that, that came back. I have one if you need one, Marty. Okay. Yep, I think we need it. Does it work? Yes, I'm glad to see it. Let's see, Okay, so what I'd like you all to remember from this today is um, and again, you know, we work this all the time, and I want to kind of lay out the basic things so you can really take away some knowledge here that you can, when you hear about things going into space, you understand more about them. First thing is that there's something called a polar orbit, and an equatorial orbit, and a geosynchronous orbit. Geosynchronous and equatorial, kind of the same, except... Oh. 
Okay. Well, anyway, right up here, <laughs> this is a geosynchronous orbit. This is where the satellites, like for your direct TV and all this stuff, these satellites rotate out there exactly with the speed of the Earth. So they're always hovering over the same spot. Equatorial orbit goes the same way around the equator, plus or minus, but it's not out. This is like 23,000 miles out. So around the Earth can be like 110 or something. You just got to get high enough up so you don't burn up soon. So you're up, same kind of thing, but just a lot lower down. Vandenberg Air Force Base, they want to launch a shuttle into polar orbit. All like our spy satellites, all that stuff, those are polar orbit because you launch and it goes around the poles. So what happens in 24 hours? The Earth totally turns, rotates under the satellite. So in 24 hours, you can get a picture of everything on the Earth. Opposed to if you're just going around the equator, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna overfly anything north of where it's going or south of where it's going. So that's a whole big distinction. And they wanted the shuttle, shuttle flying from Florida flies around e the equator. Plus, they've been up as high as like the space station, up 50, 51.6 degrees, I think. So you picture the, the latitude that high. So here you're going up like 90 degrees. So everything, you're over flying here. So they wanted to be able to have the space shuttle and its payloads and crew and the more manned orbiting lab program before that fly over everything in 24 hours. You know, Cold War and all that stuff. So, okay. And then, we have to talk faster because we want to get into all this. A um, whole lot of energy and excitement about the shuttle program. The early days, probably a lot of you remember that. It was a very exciting thing. After a while, it's like you don't even know they're launching. But we're going back to the early days, like up to the Challenger pretty much. Maybe first 10, 15 flights were always in the news. After that, coverage slowed down a bit. But when we were building up at Vandenberg, I remember going to eat at the officers club there and we get a space in the parking lot. That was like, wow, what are they gonna do when things get flying from here? And uh, then I have a lot of great pictures and uh, for a behind the scenes VIP tour, myself, Denny also, we spent a lot of time at Edwards Air Force Base, Kennedy Space Center training, and then at Vandenberg, because we had to learn everything to, to do at Vandenberg. And then lastly in red, there's a lot of politics behind the shuttle. It was basically, um, it was overstated what its capabilities were, so Congress would buy into it. Uh, they were supposed to originally launch one a month. And uh, that, so you, and each orbiter was supposed to fly 100 missions. So you figured four orbiters, there should have been 400 missions flown. The reality was over the whole program with all the orbiters, 135 missions. So it, it fell short. But not really. Technically, it was amazing what it did. It's just politics made them say, yeah, we're going to be able to do all this stuff. And all that feeds into the accident, why that happened, the hard push from political. So we'll get into that more. So we're going to go back in time a little bit to manned orbit laboratory program. And um, basically, in the 1960s, this whole thing, OK, this one. Um, a man presence in polar orbit was the whole thing. Vandenberg, they wanted because again, you overfly the entire Earth. And in 24 hours, you can get pictures of anything underneath it. And uh, so this is what it looked like. This was like, remember the Gemini program? It was Gemini spacecraft on top, and then upper stage, um, and the whole Gemini kind of Titan configuration. And then the crew would live in here, and you, you know, you look at like the space station now, it's probably 50 times larger than this little space here. And we're on board with the Russians. So, and uh, they've been the leaders with a lot of them. So the world has changed a whole lot in that time. But anyway, um, manned orbiting laboratory, mole program. And again, uh, there's that chart right up here on the table from there that Bernie had. And then again, the whole concept is repeated for the space shuttle program. And the whole thing is polar orbit launch. And there were a number, I forget how many original mole astronauts there were, but one of them was Bob Crippen, name might sound familiar to you. He flew on the first space shuttle mission with John Young, it's the first time it ever launched, and he was a mole astronaut. He was training to go on this, so, and then when we were going to Vandenberg launch, 
he was going to command the first launch from Vandenberg. So he was a little disappointed. He says his, his only disappointment in his whole career is he never got to fly in polar orbit. And this is that chart that's on the table. This is a 10 second chart here because I can't even read it from here. But this is actually, this is from Bernie Petty Save from 1969. This is the org chart and it's kind of cool because I looked at that one. You can see like the rocket broken down in here, Titan three, you know, the different managers for it. And just kind of a lot of history there. Here's the uh, logo for it up there. So this is the first Vandenberg crew. And here's Bob Crippen over here, who's gonna be the commander. And uh, Guy Gardner is going to be his co-pilot. And then he had um, Mike Mullane, Jerry Ross, and Dale Gardner as the crew. And Brett Watterson was a mission specialist from the Air Force in LA. And then Pete Aldrich, name, name might sound familiar, he was the secretary of the Air Force. Um, he named himself to the crew and bumped off the other mission specialist. But Frank has its privilege. Uh, Marty, I thought you weren't going to mention his name. Huh? You got a vendetta against Pete Aldrich. You weren't going to mention his name, even though he was oh, yeah. your secretary of the Air Force. Yes, yes. He used to visit Thank you for that. Well, the other thing about the crew, uh, and I can speak from authority, I guess, uh, we didn't know any of the crew members at all. We had seven uh, bedrooms in the crew quarters, and we had no idea who was going to sleep there until about six months prior to when the, when the activation actually started in Vandenberg. So it's kind of interesting, you know, you had crew member one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <coughs> they could have walked up on the street and we wouldn't have known who they were. So it was it was kind of an interesting time. Except for Bob Crippen and Guy Gardner. Well, they, yeah. They showed up all regularly. Yeah. So that's what they looked like. And I think they're still all alive. Uh, this is a picture when you, okay, you have a garage at home for your car. This is the garage for the space shuttle. And I know it's kind of hard to figure out what you're looking at, but basically this is the opposite shape. You can kind of see like the front pulls up here, the wings kind of go around. You have to have access platforms in all these places. So they lined her up. Here's Bob Kirpin, Guy Gardner, the rest of the crew, Pete Aldrich, Jerry Ross is missing in the picture. I put another picture in up here. This is a similar thing at Vandenberg. It's called the Orbiter Maintenance and Checkout Facility, OMCF. In Florida, it's called the OPF, Orbiter Processing Facility. Same thing. You see the tail opening in the door so the tail of the orbiter can get in. You can see it's pulled in there. So same kind of building, and that's what we're looking at here. Uh, this was a picture taken uh, after when, when it looked like things were winding. Is, it, is this mic coming through okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it sounded quiet. Um, when the program was winding down and people started leaving, uh, they figured we better get a picture of everybody that's left. And this is pretty much... Uh, probably about 80 90 percent but a lot of people had transferred out or retired already but uh, like I'm in there somewhere whoops and Bernie's in there and are you were you there for that picture so anyway so a lot of people and um, this is a good time but this was kind of the goodbye shot and by the way this building was built for the mole program originally so and then it became the Space Shuttle Integrated Operations Support Complex. So all the uh, administrative things. So anyway, this is Bernie who's on the phone right here. Uh, 1984, he still looks the same, he still sounds the same, right? Sounds the same. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he, he was, as I said, he was uh, the first, he was a civilian original uh, with the shuttle program at Vandenberg and all the history here. Is, and he gave all these briefings, just under 200 of them. Here's his picture for this was like a little write up from him then, so I wanted to show him in perspective here. And uh, so here's his position he was the, Air, the shuttle technical director of Vandenberg. And uh, this is where both at Kennedy Space Center back in 84, so got this picture of us. And um, so that's kind of a little thing, but he's been a great supporter and friend through the years. And, uh, the other guy. Hmm? The other guy. This the guy uh, holding the microphone up here. <laughs> when, when his um, hair was black and his teeth were white. <laughs> so. And okay, we're going to get into some background. What time is it? 10 hours. 10 hours, so we have about an hour. Okay. So I think we'll get there good. Um, just to give you an idea of what it takes, 
It's like, yeah, you want to launch a space shuttle. What do you have to do? You need to build lots of infrastructure. And we're going to get into all these. We're going to flash your next pictures. But basically, all the facilities uh, had a V in front of them for Vandenberg. And they put a number then for the different, they're called station sets. So now you kind of, this was the lingo that we used. They would station set this, station set that, whatever. So we'll have pictures of all this. V-17 was a landing facility. This was a, a regular runway at Vandenberg that they extend <coughs> out, like, I forget how. It's, I think it's the world's longest runway or close to it. Yeah, the Air Force is uh, the, not only longest, but widest runway. Oh, so it is longest in my, yeah. and it still is, and uh, because they needed that for the orbiter to land. I don't know, still Vandenberg is like, it's funny to have the longest and widest runway and maybe a couple airplanes come in a week, but anyway. Um, and uh, then, you probably don't have any idea what this is, but we'll get into it. The 18 is the mate, the mate facility. Basically, the orbiter gets to Vandenberg one of two ways. It comes back from space, lands on the runway, or it flies in on the back of the 747. You've all seen pictures of that. I have some good pictures. And uh, so that's how you take it off, because this thing weighs like 100 tons. So how do you take this thing off an airplane, pull out the airplane, set it down, and then move it to where it needs to go? It's a pretty intricate kind of situation. So, Marty, mm -hmm. why don't you just go to the picture? But I just want to go through the rest of these, though. Okay. Um, V-19 OMCF, we talked about this, OPF at Kennedy Space Center, where you pull it in to do the work on it, the garage. V-27, flight crew systems, that was Denny's whole area, and I worked for him with that. V-23 is the launch complex, this whole thing, and we have a lot of pictures of that. That's a launch pad in South Vandenberg, and the launch control center was next to it. Then you have the solid rocket boosters, and they have their own building. We'll get into that. Uh, this was down in Port Wainimi uh, with the boosters that come back, they splash down the ocean. You have to be able to capture them, tow them up, and refurbish them. So that was the whole thing. Uh, you had to store external tanks and process them and get them ready for launch. The whole facility for that. Uh, we have a dock because you have to get the tanks into Vandenberg, so they had to build out a whole dock area where, they, where the ships could come in, the barges could come in, you could offload external tanks to keep them in the inventory there. Uh, transportation, it's like how are you moving everything around, the roads, whatever they had to do. Communications, utilities, and logistics. There, this is a huge building. V eighty eight was a huge. I don't even know if it's huge, but all the all the parts. It's like where you store all your shuttle parts. So anyway, so that's a quick overview. We're going to get into each of these and flash through. Okay. Okay. So I put these together. Here's a view of the runway. And um, so. I'll wind up. This is the main thing. Maybe we got a lot of good color pictures of this. This is just over. These are out of a, a, a manual. Uh, so here's where you pull in the 747 with the orbiter, and then you hook on the orbiter, lift it up, back up the 747, lower the orbiter down, put it on a transporter, or put it on its landing gear. And then V19, this is the, the garage, basically. So. Um, and here, here's like in Florida, the, the door that rolls up here so the tail fits in, and you pull the shuttle into this building. This side is a whole payload side where there's two kind of payloads. Payloads you put in horizontally, or payloads that you install vertically out of the pad. And uh, for, the vert, for the horizontal payloads, they would get them, they never did, but they get them ready in here, and then hoist them over, and then lower them down into the open cargo bay of the orbit is sitting down in here. That was the plan. And then this is the launch pad. We'll get into that a whole lot, the whole building up of that complex. This was the manned orbiting labs launch pad. And uh, there's more pages of this. This was like a publicity kind of thing when, when the uh, discovery was completed, building in Palmdale. Instead of taking it right to Florida, they did a flyby. For us, they brought it up and flew it around Vandenberg. I get some pictures of it, I'll show you later. But here they got a nice picture of the pad as its progress at the time. And here's the, the discovery. And discovery was gonna be our dedicated orbiter. So pretty much because you know, we were all military missions, I mean 99.999, I guess it could be a non-military, but Vandenberg's purpose. Again, polar orbit, military missions. So the orbiter had different configurations in it for handling those military payloads. 
And then V27, this is a flight crew systems building. Um, actually, is that it? Let's see, back of that. No, this is it here. This that's a smaller building here. This was a remote launch control center they were building up. But this is the flight crew systems building where the astronauts would stay and that. And then um, this is the launch control center at the pad. We're gonna get into that. Air Force typically have their launch control centers right where the thing launched. And the walls are like five feet thick or whatever. But as you'll see later, that wasn't good enough. Um, solid rocket booster processing. So all the segments like what, you know, happened on the Challenger, the boosters have to be stacked up, like end up like two pencils on the pad, then you hang the external tank in between, then you hang the orbiter on the tank. So, but all the boosters pieces come in on rail cars and they have to go in here and be built up, whatever you're gonna do with them, prepared and then brought up to the pad in pieces and segments, I think it's seven segments and stack them up on the pad. And um, this is down in Port Lanemi here. So again, you bring when the boosters come back, you have to be able to get them ready and to, to whatever you're gonna do, take out of them, you got damage to them, you got electronics you have to replace, they have the seawater in them, you gotta clean them, all this stuff. And uh, here's our boat dock at Vandenberg. So this is where the big barges will come in and bring in the external tanks. And then this is, just talks about all the transportation because it's about a 17 mile trip, I believe, from where the orbiter would land and get processed in the garage to the launch pad. So you have to be able to transport it down there. And then there's all kind of other transportation infrastructure that had to be changed too. Like Denny was mentioning to me about the stop signs that had to be able to fold down and all this. There was a lot of, everything had to be fair. We had power lines in the way. Okay, this is the logistics building. Huge building, all, these are all shuttle parts in here. Well, never got to be that way, but they're getting, that's, that was the intention. So huge, huge building for all the parts that you need to keep the fleet going. Okay, so now we're gonna get into Vandenberg a little bit. Let me fold this up. You all kind of know where Santa Barbara is and um, San Luis Obispo on the coast. So LA, LA is basically about 150 miles south down here. And then San Francisco is about 230 miles north up here. Santa Barbara is about 50 miles to the south. So this is Vandenberg. Can you still hear me? Um, so this is Vandenberg, north base and south base. It's, and it's divided in half by a road and uh, kind of a river that goes through there. So this is the runway. You can see the runway. And this is, is this the largest? It's the third largest Air Force base, I think, right? Third largest? And I forget how many, it's like 50 miles of coastline. 100,000 acres. Huh, they're about 50 miles of coastline, I think. Yeah. So it's a lot of prime California real estate right here. Up on the north, like the Minuteman test missions, Peacekeeper used to launch from up there. Delta II still launches from up there. Pretty much that was north base. South base was all the big heavy rockets. Um, shuttle was going from there. Um, all the Titans went from there and the Atlas. So these were like the real big, you know, you need to put 15, 20, 30,000 pounds in orbit. It's gonna come from south base, kind of smaller satellite or a um, ICBM mission, which will launch to the west, the Kwajalein Islands, and come out of North Base. So, so now just kind of looking up at this picture, I have like kind of a snapshot of, so here's like the runway up here, a little shot of North Base, you got a picture. And here's South Base, about 17 miles away from that, and you can see the shuttle launch pad right here, that whole infrastructure. And I won't get into this, but this basically all those pieces we went through, all the V numbers. So V17, 18, uh, the garage, flight crew systems, all this stuff, this just shows the flow of all those things. Okay, now some, finally some cool pictures. And um, so remember we showed the orbiter up in the mate be mate device. So, so the airplane pulls in, 747 pulls in on its back, then you hook the sling on, it has attach points, lift the orbiter off, back up the airplane, and then set down the orbiter. And uh, so here's a picture of it. 
this is a this is made in Italy by a company called Cometo, and very complex. I forget how many wheels are on this thing, but there were a lot, and they had to be able to steer it really precisely. So that was the transporter for it, and uh, then. So here it is, obviously, with the 747 pulled out, and here it is hanging. This is actually, that's not a Vandenberg, that is, it's red, this looks like it's an Edwards. Edwards is, has a red on it. So you can see under here, the um, attach point, you can't see the attach points, but you can see where the fuel line's going from the external tank, these two things. I have some close-up pictures of that later. So that kind of covers that. This is a general picture of it sitting on the ground after it landed at Edwards. Um, and, a launch picture. and here we are transporting. It's on the transporter driving the 17 miles down to Salt Base. And we'll, I get some good pictures of this, where they actually had to cut out the sides of the hill. You can see the road cuts here. So there was adequate clearance for the wings. Kind of like, remember, they brought the uh, uh, Endeavor through the streets of LA. That, that was a lot more complicated than this actually, but um, this was the, more than had been done at the time. But this is kind of like what they did in LA with the Endeavor. So, uh, so here it is. This was the uh, route going down the 17 miles, and it's on the transporter. And um, again, this this never got to be a real orbiter. This was the Enterprise that we brought in for all the fit checks. You know, they built the facilities, and they had a see, okay, does it fit and everything. So these are just a couple of cool pictures here of coming down with the Escort and the trucks and coming down. So had this been an ongoing program, you know, we would have been doing this every couple months probably. So. And then simultaneously on the launch pad, okay, so here's the arrival of it on the pad. And in Florida, there's the, huge building called the Vehicle Assembly Building, where they built the Saturn moon rockets and all that. We had to emulate that here, but only with one, one building on the pad. So this is the mobile service tower, and these things actually roll. These are huge buildings that roll. So this one would roll back, it would be back here, and this one would roll forward, and this is the front of, that, of this one. So these are, this is a huge garage door. It's all lifted up. And then this is all wide open. And um, so what they do, it's like, okay, we got to do this operation. I pull the shuttle and stack it up on the pad. They roll the buildings together and hook them together. It makes a complete environmental enclosure. And uh, here inside, here is like, um, let's see, okay, so stacking up a solid rocket motor segment, for instance. This is one solid rocket motor segment. And this is like where it connects, where the O-rings are, the whole story that we heard about the Challenger, but that's like, so it's at the joints, and then they'd set, have this, and they'd put another 